UC Berkeley as a space scientist for 20 years. Um, I was a PI on a NASA satellite, uh, Extreme Ultraviolet uh, Explorer, which we re-entered into the Indian Ocean in 1996. Um, and then, uh, more recently, I've been working in France. I was the director of the Astronomical Observatory in Marseille. Um, a lot of specialty in advanced optics and so on. So um, I'm by training and fascination and passion a physical scientist and an astrophysicist. But uh, I've had a hybrid career, mostly because I had a disturbing, disturbed childhood. Um, when I came home from school in the afternoon from primary school, my father was there painting in our living room and eventually his studio. But I knew he was a research engineer, so I thought that's what scientists and engineers did, is they painted. Uh, and it was only when I uh, got into the pipeline of formal education that I understood you had to make choices. Um, but um, then my, my dad died in 1982, and one of the things I inherited was this Leonardo journal, a scholarly journal for artists working with science and technology. I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about it. And so I was an astronomer by day, and in the art world by night, sort of an inverted situation. Um, and then three years ago, I got this amazing offer from the University of Texas at Dallas to come and teach uh, technology students. And so that's what I'm doing now. So um, I've, I've really had a hybrid career. Um, and so tonight, I'm going to connect the two sides of my, my nightlife and my daylife uh, and talk about space culture a little bit. And I have written about this over the years, and uh, um, there's a lot going on. Um, I've been in zero gravity. Uh, I went on the cosmonaut training plane uh, in um, Star City outside of Moscow with 15 artists who we all took into zero gravity. I was sick, they weren't, uh, so they got to do their artworks and performances, and I had to lie on the floor <laughs> because I was just sick. Um, so um, I'm, you know, I'm excited about both um, the science and the art side of, of space culture. Um, I just wanted to start off with a few more details about the, the Leonardo organization. Um, it's kind of an exciting time. When my dad started this in 1967, he wrote down on a napkin everybody he could find that was involved in both art and science. And there were about 18 people. Um, Today, there are thousands of people. It's really an exciting, uh, exciting time in this field. Uh, and it's a mixture of people like, like me, who are scientists, deeply engaged in the arts and humanities, uh, artists using science and technology for all kinds of weird things, um, and then scholars still studying all of that, historians and psychologists and so on. So it's a very uh, interesting interdisciplinary group of people and, and, and field. Um, we've championed the writing um, by artists about their own work, um, which in 1967, when my dad started this journal, was kind of a strange idea. You know, it was the critics that wrote about the artists. Well, in the science world, as a scientist, writing is not your avocation, but you write about your scientific experiments and your scientific discoveries. So why shouldn't artists be able to do that too? So this publication has championed that kind of thing. And amazingly, if you go to Google Scholar, we're the fourth ranked visual art journal on the planet right now in terms of impact. So what a delight. My dad is chuckling in his grave. Um, um, and we'll be celebrating our 50th anniversary in a couple of years, so we're looking for bright ideas of what we should do. I want to do a party on the International Space Station, but I'm not sure we can crowdfund that for uh, enough people to make it worthwhile. Um, as I said, uh, we have a journal, but uh, as Piero mentioned, we have a book series, journals, e-zines, you name it. We've published something like 8,000 individual authors. If you took those 8,000 people and their families, that's uh, about 20,000 people. That's a bigger creative community than was in Florence in the Renaissance. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on right now, but of course these people aren't all in Florence, they're all over the planet. And so what we do is try and network them, and the lasers is part of that attempt to try and connect this very diverse creative community. So uh, as Piero mentioned, um, we just finished uh, a study funded by the uh, National Science Foundation, which is now available online at MIT Press as an open access ebook, 
Uh, and we basically studied what was going on internationally and made a number of recommendations. So if you're interested in what's going on internationally, uh, I refer you to that, to that ebook, uh, which you can get online. Um, the other project, which I just started about six months ago, is called Creative Disturbance. Uh, and we actually have the URL for creativedisturbance.org. Um, and what we're trying to do is exactly the kind of thing that Piero is doing in the lasers, but trying to connect people that wouldn't otherwise meet. And the way we're doing that is using podcasts. So it's like you were sitting in a cafe in the 1880s Vienna, listening to the conversation down the table. Uh, and so the idea is to get experts talking to each other about what they're interested in, what they're stuck on at the moment, uh, and just put the podcast up and then people can listen in and contact them if they're interested. Um, I call these micro niches. Some of these topics, there are probably only 30 people on the whole planet interested. Well, we're, let me tell you, we're gonna connect those people. Um, and we have a space exploration in the arts channel. So if you're a scientist involved in the arts or an artist involved in the sciences or technology, we'd be delighted to post your podcast and see who might listen in. They all go up on iTunes, uh, so you can listen as you're commuting or uh, hiking or jogging or whatever you do when you're listening uh, to your earbuds. And we have channels on the sonification of scientific data. We have a channel on the arts and earth sciences and, and, and numerous other ones. So it, it's kind of a fun experiment. So I encourage you to listen in whilst you're doing your exercise regime. Listen to a podcast on, on creative disturbance. The other thing that I wanted to mention is a really interesting development in the last uh, few months. The National Academy of Science, the National uh, Academy of Engineering, and the National Institute of Medicine decided to dedicate one of their uh, national conferences, the NAFKE conferences, on earth science, engineering, and medicine frontier collaborations. So that's exactly the kind of stuff that's being discussed in the lasers. It'll be in November. Um, and uh, the steering committee is, is led by David Edwards, uh, who's a genetic uh, engineer entrepreneur at Harvard, runs the Art Science Lab in Paris, and a very interesting group of people, such as the engineer Henry Petrovsky, that many of you probably know his uh, writings in engineering. So um, it's kind of interesting. Um, when my dad started this publication in 1967, there were 18 people he could write the names of, and now the National Academy is convening them uh, in, a, in a major national uh, event. So uh, as you can tell, I'm just excited. Uh, if you want to attend that conference, you have to apply by April 16. Okay, so let me now come to the main topic of, of why uh, Piero invited me, although it's not a thematic evening as I understand it, but maybe we'll make some unlikely disturbing connections between the talks. Uh, and so um, obviously with my double interest in space activities and the arts, uh, I've been very busy working with uh, this community of practice. Um, the, the beginning, of course, was my, my dad, as I mentioned. He, he was actually a rocket scientist. He was at Caltech in the 1930s, worked with Theodore von Kármán. They led the first successful high-altitude rocket that uh, uh, America launched. And he co-founded and directed the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab, uh, co-founded the an aerospace company. Uh, or a general corporation. So he, he was very much involved between the arts and space. Um, in 1970, he wrote uh, an article in the Leonardo Journal with his vision of connecting uh, space activities with cultural activities. And then 25 years later, I wrote uh, a second article uh, sort of bringing things up to date. And so um, I've been working with this, this group of artists and group of scientists in this field for, for a long time. We set up a small Leonardo Space Arts working group so that we, we network and we help each other on the various events that we're doing. Um, there's an email list called the Space Arts Network if you want to just be kept, kept abreast of what's going on. And we'll be releasing an ebook on space activities in the arts uh, this summer. Um, one of the things we did, which was kind of fun, um, I'm an elected member of the International Academy of Astronautics. And I belong to the International Federation of Astronautics. And we set up a technical activities committee for the cultural utilization of space. Uh, and it's museum directors and space engineers. Uh, and we try and open up access to space systems, zero gravity flights, space data, 
a lot easier now that so much of it's available on the web and space technologies uh, if you want to go into a centrifuge as an artist and so on. And so we've been working as a professional uh, committee uh, trying to encourage the cultural utilization of space. Um, and uh, there's uh, all kinds of things going on. Um, the other thing that kind of comes into this in my way of thinking about things, um, in the 1960s, the International Academy of Astronautics was the first professional organization to set up a SETI committee for the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. I was, in those days, it was uh, pretty risky. Of course, now there's a SETI institute down the road. Um, and I've been in that committee uh, also connecting um, the, the, and many artists are obviously interested in these subjects. As you probably remember, Carl Sagan sent a CD out on, a, on the, one of the pioneer probes to be collected by an ETI at some later time. Um, and it's an international committee. Seth Shostak, who's at the SETI Institute, was the chair for many years. And it's been a lot of fun uh, working with them, uh, working on the nitty gritty of, of some of these questions um, that include working with the United Nations Committee on, for the Peaceful Utilization of Outer Space. Um, in my 1995 article, I kind of inventory different ways that artists were involved in space. And there's almost every kind of artistic expression that you can imagine. So um, the, the easy one is, of course, uh, many, many artists use space data uh, as raw material for their artistic work. Um, and th that, that is a very uh, expanded field, many, many exhibitions. The Smithsonian has exhibited many times. Um, there are other ones which are more tied to our psychological and mythological ideas about the human race. Um, it was born in Africa and is migrating maybe to the edge of space. Uh, and so there are many semi-mystical uh, artworks uh, that, that are produced every year. Um, there are a number of artworks that have been made specifically in space to be viewed from Earth. Um, uh, a number of people have proposed uh, doing laser imaging onto the moon. Um, a lot of astronomers are disturbed by that idea. We don't like the idea of, uh, of uh, intentionally uh, polluting uh, light pollution of, of outer space. Um, and then, but there have been a few experiments of that kind, of course, um, with infrared light, which you can uh, shoot, at the, shoot at the moon. Um, there's a lot of artists doing moon bounce uh, artworks at the moment, where you get a radio telescope and you send your imagery to the moon, and then when it bounces back, you, you redisplay it. Um, and then, of course, art on Earth to be viewed from space. There are a number of very large projects that have been designed specifically to, to be seen by astronauts. Um, and then a number of artworks to be viewed in space. One of the very early works was by the sculptor Arthur Woods, who flew his sculpture on the Russian space station and the International Space Station. Uh, and the uh, astronauts and cosmonauts actually got to play with his sculpture in zero gravity. Um, the Japanese Space Agency has been very active, uh, JAXA, um, funding uh, uh, projects by artists to be done in, in, uh, in the International Space Station. So it's a very broad spectrum of activities, all the way from traditional arts to new media arts to uh, various kinds of experimental art forms. Um, in thinking about this, um, I kind of like to think of the phases of space art. Uh, and of course, until Sputnik, uh, there were several thousand years of space art going on with people creating cultural expression that were connected to the sky, the stars, the planets, and so on. Um, of course, with the invention of the telescope and Copernicus, uh, that uh, unleashed a whole number of new forms of art making from the new kind of imagery that suddenly became accessible thanks to the telescope. But then, of course, uh, with Sputnik, um, that opened up a whole number of different things. Um, the, the, there have been a number of projects uh, using satellites, bouncing off satellites, uh, sending things up in satellites that re-entered the Earth. And so that really became a very different phase where artists have been involved in space uh, technically, uh, making technical innovations, and, and so on. Um, I'm going to argue a little bit later in my presentation that, in fact, I think we are now in a space culture. And I guess the simple way of phrasing that is, if magically today we forbid all rockets to be launched from the surface of the Earth, I suspect we'd be very uncomfortable really quickly. 
Uh, not only I couldn't use my GPS to drive home tonight in Oakland, <laughs> but of course uh, our weather satellites are all dependent on rockets being launched. As you probably know, there's concern right now that some of the Earth monitoring satellites, there's going to be a gap in data because uh, nobody's launched uh, some of the replacement uh, Earth satellites. And so, uh, in a very real sense, we are now in a space culture. And of course, looking forward, the big question is, is the human race really going to move off this planet or not? And there, clearly all the interest in citizen space and civilian space activities are developments where it's just a big question mark. Uh, it's not that easy. And space isn't just further than Antarctica. It's really unpleasant. Um, and so uh, I, I, I'm a little bit skeptical, but we'll see. Um, so pre-57, indeed, uh, a very wide variety of, of art forms, literature, of course, and science fiction. Um, many of it that embodied various forms of utopianism and cosmic uh, mythologies. Um, that's Jules Verne's From the Earth to the Moon, which was the book that actually inspired my, inspired my dad in, in 1920 uh, to get into the space business. Um, the arts of the space age, um, there are now a number of human monuments on, uh, on the outer planets and in space, not a very large number of them. Um, and of course, um, something like 60 or 70 artists have now flown in, in zero gravity and done very short time scale um, artworks uh, in, in that environment. Um, after the appearance of space culture, as I said, um, the, the world economy is, is joined at the hip in terms of its infrastructure uh, between space and ground-based systems. Um, one, one of the interesting uh, meetings I was at, at, at was the World Space Congress in Hyderabad in India, and the uh, head of the Indian Space Agency gave this wonderful talk about how we were going to save the planet by mixing space technology and Earth technologies to keep the Earth in balance. Well, he, he was an optimist. Obviously, we're all worried that our civilization is out of balance with, uh, with the planet. But clearly, if we're going to um, get on top of climate change and global warming, space systems are, are part of that infrastructure. And then beyond, of course, down the road, Google is sponsoring the Google X uh, prizes and so on. Um, and so there is a number of uh, private uh, space, space activities going on at the moment um, that may indeed lead to uh, much more. One of the things that uh, is really wonderful now is what, what I call open observatories. Uh, as you know, if, if uh, you collect astronomical data today, people put it online, <coughs> and all, other, all kinds of people other than astronomers analyze that data and make discoveries with it. And so there, there's been really a proliferation of really interesting work by artists using that data that's now available in the, in the online repositories. Um, one of the most interesting annual space art events is called Cosmica. It's in Mexico City uh, every summer. And let me tell you, if, you have a, if you're interested, I encourage you to attend that. It's really a fascinating uh, event. It's held in an experimental art museum, the Laboratorio in, in Mexico City. And it draws hundreds and hundreds of people to the various professional talks and performances and so on. And one of the very visible groups in Mexico City is the Mexican Space Collective. 14 Mexican artists, they flew on the zero gravity uh, training plane in Moscow two months ago, 14 of them. They have funding to fund, fly three satellites built by artists. Uh, it turns out that the Mexican Space Agency was only created two years ago, and the first Mexican satellites may be artists satellites. So a uh, really fascinating group of artists uh, in the hacker maker community in Mexico City. Uh, and as I said, they got funding to fly three of these satellites uh, a piggyback on, on commercial launches. Um, to finish my remarks, I just want to um, leave you with a, a little bit of angst. Um, as someone who works in the scientific establishment, I, some of you may be familiar with a famous report in 1945, Science, the Endless Frontier, uh, commissioned uh, by uh, Roosevelt, by Vannevar Bush. New frontiers of the mind are before us, and if uh, they are pioneered with the same vision and boldness and drive with which we have waged the war, the Second World War, 
we can create a fuller and more fruitful employment and a fuller and more fruitful life. Probably the only people that believe in that are in Silicon Valley at the moment. When I travel around this planet, there is a huge amount of skepticism whether science and technology is really leading to full employment and a more fruitful life. So there's a lot of concern. Um, a lot of science just doesn't make political sense, and it's not just in this country where the climate change deniers seem to be uh, gaining a, the ascendancy. Uh, in, in 2012, after a bruising budget battle, Alan Leshner said the link between science and the rest of society is a little fragile these days. Um, and so um, I guess the question is, have we reached the end of the space age or not? And I'm going to finish with this thought. Uh, here I'll, I'll finish up. Some of you may remember that in China, the emperor decided to burn his fleet and focus on internal matters. Warnings were placed on notice boards stating that anyone who dares to step over the borderline shall be beheaded. And he chose to take the non-state spaces of the, of the coast by creating a sanitary cordon of walls between the people and the sea. At that time, there were giraffes in the zoo in Beijing <laughs> uh, in 1371, because the Chinese ships had gone all around Africa and had collected giraffes. So maybe we are at the end of the space age. So I'm going to have to finish there. I won't uh, go into the same.